Well, good morning, Stevens Creek. How you feeling? Good. Now, y'all, uh, let me just put this out there. I know now that y'all know how to talk back to somebody. So this uh, quietness y'all be doing to me, I know it's fake. I've seen it. I just saw that. So I'm excited to preach this morning because I know y'all know how to talk back to me. Um, also, second thing, don't send me that email. It's going to end up in spam. But man, I am so excited and elated to be before you this morning. I just believe God has something to say to us. But how many of y'all have been enjoying this Let's Rebuild series? It's been absolutely phenomenal, life-shaping and life-changing. So it's been really good. If you have your Bibles, we're going to go to a, a very familiar passage of Scripture, Psalm 23. I believe in this text, there are some good golden nuggets that the Lord would use to kind of encourage our spirits and our hearts going forward, all right? So uh, most of you probably know it by heart, but we will read the entirety of the psalm. Uh, Psalm 23, starting at the first verse, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want to talk to you for a few moments on getting back to the basics. Let's pray. Father, we thank you and bless you for this day and this opportunity to share your word. I pray that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to receive what you would say in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was uh, reflecting, we had company uh, a couple weeks ago, and I was reflecting on the fact um, of my favorite movies. Now, my, one of my favorite movies, I'm a Star Wars fan. Um, if you haven't seen them, uh, that's your assignment after service today. Go see Star Wars. But uh, one of my other favorite movies is Back to the Future. Back to the, yeah, all right, yes, okay, I'm not by myself. Um, Back to the Future, it came out before I was born, but it is one of those classic films. Back to the Future really is something that we all can identify with. Sometimes we look at our parents and say, what in the world happened here? And other times we are looking at ourselves like, how do I fix this? How do things get better? But the main premise of Back to the Future is Marty McFly, he is looking at his life, looking at his mom and dad trying to figure out what went wrong. He meets up with this crazy doc. He gets in a car, drives 88 miles per hour, and he goes back to the future, or rather back in the past, and sees the root cause of the issues, and he sees the basic foundational things that need to put be put back in order. He writes the ship, and because of him going back to the basics, he is able to establish a better future. And, and y'all, this is the premise of what I want to say today is that if we can get back to the basics, God will make our future brighter and better than ever before. As we look over the landscape of our society, nation, and world, we can say that there are some basic elements that seem to be missing. Uh, There seems to be a lack of kindness, empathy, joy, and care, and uh, if we're honest, critical thinking. There are some uh, gaps and um, basic elements that are missing. But all of these are symptoms to the problem. The real root cause of the issue that we are facing as our world is humanity as a whole has neglected and forgotten their need for God. We have walked away from the basic fundamental essence of what we are and what we are supposed to do. And uh, this is not new information. In fact, Uh, humanity's history has been a pendulum that kind of swings or ebbs and flows towards God and away from God, towards God and away from God. But the dangerous thing is that it seems like as the pendulum begins to swing away from God, it is swinging further and further away from God. Humanity is forgetting its need for God. 
David, the writer of this psalm, is someone who understood all too well how life has some ups and downs, some ebbs and flows in their relationship or care towards God. In many places, David is literally described as a man after God's own heart. But there are other places in David's life where he was cold, shut off, and away from God. But the good news is, as if a tide recedes, it can also return again. And I'm just so glad that we are at a place and we can be reminded to get back to the basics, get back to the fundamentals, that if we set the basics right, we can see God work and move in our lives like never before. You see, the call to go back to the basics is a call to get things back in order to realign our perspectives, to uh, get the essentials in the right order. You see, in a world full of excess, the basic fundamentals of our faith gives us clarity. In this multitude of voices screaming out and typing out to us, we can find clarity in the basics of our faith. Here's some things that I want to show you in this text. This text is a foundational piece because one theologian puts it like this, that you can preach the entirety of the Bible from Psalm 23, that every element or theme of scripture is found in this Psalm. It's a foundational piece. And there are four things I want to show you and things that we need to be reminded of, of the basics that will help us live the life that God has called us to live. Here's the first thing is that we need to recognize some things. There are some things we need to recognize. There are some foundational things we need to recognize. Here's the first thing is uh, um, David says the Lord is. And the first thing we need to recognize is that God is. I know uh, they want to make this thing ambiguous and say the universe or the intelligent being or design. But can I tell you there is one God, one creator who sits high and looks low. That there is a God in heaven that he is. I I love the fact that David starts here and he does not read God's resume. He just declares that the Lord is. It is similar to the way God introduces himself to us. In the book of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God, there is one who is greater and higher than all of us. He stepped out of nothing, stepped onto nothing, spoke into nothing, and created something that even his words now are still echoing through the universe. His word that let them there be light. It's still echoing. I look outside and I can see the light. I see the firmament and the fact that he hung the stars and he made the birds sing and the fish to, to swim, that there is a creator God. The very fact that you exist is because God exists. There is someone greater than you, and I know the world wants to turn away from it, but today is a reminder that we can stand flat-footed and say there is a God. There is a God. This is what uh, Paul says uh, to folks in Athens in uh, Acts chapter 17, verse 28. Paul is giving a sermon to the folks in Athens, and he says, there is a God. He, He reminds them that there is a creator. He says it like this, that in him we move and um, live and have our being. In fact, what he says to them is your poets even say that we are his offspring. We are not here because God lacked anything. Uh, The creation of humanity was out of an expression of love that God desired to do. And if we are going to get back to the basics, we need to stand firm on the fact that there is a God. To speak with assurance and clarity that God is. But not only is there a God, but the next step of this equation, David says, the Lord is my shepherd. Y'all, the thing we need to recognize and acknowledge is our, pers- our need for a personal relationship with God. It is not enough to acknowledge his existence but we were created to be in relationship with him. We were created 
to be in a close proximity to God. In fact, in Genesis chapter 3, they had daily invitations and walks with God, but sin got in the way and interrupted our connection. But thanks be to God, he sent Jesus Christ to repair the bridge, and now we have access back to the Father. Now we have access to be back in relationship with our Creator. And let me tell you this, that the very void of your soul, the thing that you want to feel, is found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. David understood this very clearly, and he knew it was not enough to acknowledge God, but I need to pursue a personal relationship with him, that I cannot depend on my mother, my father, my grandfather's faith in order to have a relationship that I need to, as scripture says, work out my own salvation, that I need to have personal relationship with God. That this is literally how God created it, that he wanted us to be in communion with him. This is the opportunity that we have, is that God invites us to his table. He says in the book of Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone opens the door, I will come and dine with them, that he desires personal relationship. And in order for us to be whole, in order for us to fulfill uh, the, the voids in our lives, we need to be in personal relationship with God. Uh, that's the second prong to the three-pronged stool of the basics of things we need to recognize. Here's the third one. We need to recognize our need for submission to the Lordship of Christ. It is not enough for us to be at the table, but we need to recognize our position and seat at the table. This is what David says, the Lord is my shepherd. You see, a shepherd is in charge, and the sheep follow. And in our experience and walk with God, our position and proximity is in submission and surrenderance to the will and plan and purpose of God for our lives. Y'all, I know this one is difficult. Uh, My mama told me about how difficult this is, and uh, parents, if you don't have the greatest story, maybe not tell your children Um, you know, the origin stories of how you and uh, your spouse met. This is what my mama told me. She said she took one look at my daddy and said, no, 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 no. (laughs) Now, I didn't know how to take that because I looked like my daddy. And so I was just wondering, uh, did I come out and you say no, 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 no? (laughs) But she said no. And then, y'all, it gets better. She went into prayer and fasting for the Lord to say, anybody but him, Jesus. <laughs> Eventually, she relented and, hi, here I am. But here's what she said to me. If I would have chosen my way, I would have missed the blessing of God. And can I tell you? that we need to be in a posture of surrenderance and submission to God. That the basic things that we need to recognize is that God is, that we need a personal relationship with him, but in that relationship, we need to recognize our position, which is in total surrenderance. That is yes to your will, God, yes to your way, whatever you want to do, I trust you. I'm going to follow you. Where you lead me, I will go. But here's the good news, y'all, that if we get these basics right, if we can get this in alignment, it lets us move to the next level. And this this is what happens when we remember uh, the things that we need to recognize and we get that in order, it gives us access to the benefits we can receive. There are benefits for getting things in order and getting in the right place. There are benefits for walking with God. Here's the first one, y'all. He says the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This is the first benefit. That's the benefit of provision. Uh, Y'all, this is what Paul says is that, and my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. I I know y'all in here looking cute, 
fine and divine, but the truth of the matter is if it had not been for the Lord who was on your side, where would you be? If it had not been for the provision of God, how would you have eaten? How would you have clothed yourself? God is a God who provides. How many know God owns the cattle on a thousand hills? This is what David says, I was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor their seed begging bread. One of the benefits of God is that not only will he provide our needs, but he's our shepherd that we shall not want. The first benefit is provision. Then he says, you know, you're, you're my shepherd, I shall not want. He says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. It's the benefit of rest. In this crazy, chaotic world, here's the good news is that Jesus offers rest for our soul. That in the midst of calamity, infirmity, and difficulty, that God can offer rest to our souls. There are some of you in here with weary hearts and difficult drooped shoulders, but I got to tell you that there is a God who can offer rest. Can offer rest from the problems you are facing. Rest from you circling and pacing your room at night. God offers rest. That's one of the benefits of walking with the Lord. Here's the, the next one. He says, he leads me beside still waters. Now, scripture uh, habitually calls us sheep. I was doing a little study on sheep, and the way sheep's noses are positioned, they cannot drink water from rushing water. Because if they attempt to drink water from rapid waters, it will drown them because of where their nose is positioned. And the promise and the benefit that is listed here is that God will lead you to still waters. Here's the benefit, is that we got the benefit of his peace. How many of y'all need peace in this chaotic and dangerous world? I know that uh, scripture says it like this, that he will give us peace whose mind is stayed on him. Or rather it says he will keep in perfect peace a mind that is stayed on him. This is the good news, the benefit that we get to receive is that God offers us peace. He offers us still waters. Not only does he give us peace, but he gives us the benefit of healing. David goes on to say, he restores my soul. There are times, my brothers and sisters, that life can beat you up. There are times where we will face difficulties and after the year that we have been through, there have been some challenges. But the good news is that we serve a God who will restore our souls. He'll bring healing to us physically, healing to us internally, spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. There is healing for every place that you are wounded. Jesus took 39 stripes. The book of Isaiah says, by his stripes, we are healed. Not only does it give us access or the benefit of healing, but we get the benefit of his direction. Look, look at what he says. He says, he leads me in the path of righteousness. That even when you don't know what to do or where to go, that God will order your steps. He says, the steps of a good person are ordered by the Lord. In the book of Isaiah, he says, you will hear my voice telling you whether to go to the left or to the right, that God has particular instructions for each of our lives and the benefit of walking with God, knowing who he is, being in personal relationship and being submitted to him is that he will direct our path. But why? Here, here is the last benefit in verse three. It says, he lead me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Here's the benefit, is that we get the benefit of purpose. I know some of you are wondering, why am I here? What, what am I supposed to do? The good news is 
that you were created on purpose to fulfill purpose, that God has a plan for your life, that he has purpose for your life. In fact, in the book of Ephesians, Paul says it like this, that you are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do the good works that God planned for you long ago, that he has a purpose that it is your story for his glory, that he's going to use you to make a difference in the lives of others and to bring glory to his name. There's a purpose on your life. And in fact, you know, Paul says it like this, and he that has begun a good work in you shall complete it, accomplish it, Perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. That he is going to do what he has started in you. That he takes ownership for accomplishing the purpose for your life. These are the benefits. But y'all, the reality is that sometimes life is going to hit you in ways you never expected. And it's not an if, but it's a when. And if we're going to get back to the basics, not only do we have to recognize some things, not only do we need to receive these benefits that God gives us, but we need to reconcile some realities. There are some realities we need to reconcile. Notice what David says. After all these wonderful things that God does, He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. This is verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, he is not saying if. And here's the truth of the matter. That the benefits of walking with God do not exempt you from the realities and challenges and difficulties that life has to offer. That although God is good, although God has benefits and blessings and favor on your life, there are realities that we have to reconcile. Yes, you are both saved and love the Lord, but you are struggling in your marriage. Yes, you, you prayed for healing, but that person died. You're dealing with loss. You are struggling emotionally. Financially, physically, the reality is that there are some times that will come in our lives that our experience will not match our expectation. But here's the good news about getting the basics right with God, that they may not change our circumstance, but it changes our perspective of the circumstance. And because my perspective has been adjusted I can have the right perspective, and the right perspective leads me to fear-free living. Look at what the text says. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though I'm on the brink of breaking down, even though things are challenging and difficult and hard for me, even though this is a storm in my life, here's what he says, I will fear no evil. Because I know who God is, because I know that I got my basics right, because I've been walking with God, I've received his benefits, I will fear no evil. I won't deny the reality, but I won't let the reality shake me. I will not be moved. This is what David says in Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I can say like my good friend, brother Bone Crusher, I ain't never scared because of who my God is, because of what he has done in my life. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be afraid. I can acknowledge the realities without allowing the realities to consume me with fear and anxiety. You see, the right perspective prompts us to depend on God. Prompts us to depend on God. And here's the fourth thing, is that there are promises 
from God we can rely on. There are promises that we can depend on, we can rely on. Here's the six more promises here in verse 5 and 6. He says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. Here's the first promise that we can rely on is the promise of his presence. Y'all, I, I love this. I, I need you to notice this about the text. Is the first three verses, God is in front of us because things are going well. He is uh, making the way. He's preparing things. He is leading us from the front. But as soon as it gets dangerous, as soon as things get difficult, God moves from the front to right beside us. In fact, Scripture says it like this. He is close to the brokenhearted, that in the time of trouble, he is close to us, and that in our moment of need, he he is close to us. He is near in proximity. And in his presence, there is fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. I need you to understand that this is a promise you can rely on. That when the winds are blowing, you can depend on his presence. That when the fire is turned up hotter, he may not take you out of the fire, but he will stand right in the fire with me. And though he slay me, yet will I trust him. I can depend on his presence in my life this is the good news that while I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death he is with me God is with me and David goes on to say your rod and your staff they comfort me here's, here's another promise we can rely on it is the promise of his support and y'all God's support looks different depending on our situation. Sometimes the best way God can support us is to correct us. In fact, Scripture says he chases or corrects those he loves. That rod and that staff, sometimes it's to correct us. But there are other times that it is there to protect us. Either way, the good news is you can rely on the support of God in the challenges and difficulties that you face in life. That this is a basic premise. This is a promise that is guaranteed that God will support us. In fact, he says, call on me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you. Not only do we have the promise of his support, but look at what the next verse says. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Here's the promise, is that we can rely on God's plan. Now, y'all, I got to be honest. You know, sometimes God's plan doesn't make much sense to me. For example, there is no way if I'm having a party, my enemies are on the invite list. It's just not going to happen. I know y'all more saved than me. Y'all probably invite them and say, oh, bless. Great to have you. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is if we are walking in our own plans, in our own ways, we would do something different. And many times God's plan doesn't make sense for us. It doesn't make sense to us. But we can trust that God has a plan that will work out for us. This is the message of Romans 8 and 28. He says, for, uh, he says, all things work together for the good of them that love God and are called according to his purpose. This is a message of Jeremiah 29 and 11. For I know the plans that I have for you, says God, plans to prosper you, plans to give you a hope and a future. You may not understand God's plan, but you can rely on the fact that his plan is for your good and it's going to work out in your favor. It's the good news. He says, I, I'm preparing a place, a pr preparing the table before you in the presence of your enemies. I, I know it looks a little muddled and gray, but I'm working on this. I've got a plan in the midst of this. Here's the next thing he says. He says, he anoints my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Here's the promise here. Here's the promise you can rely on. It's God's affirmation on your life. Some of you in this room right now, some of you watching online, you are struggling with insecurities. 
There are lies that the enemy is whispering in your ears. You're never going to make it. I, I know what you did, so how could you even attend church? How are you going to, to lead and, and, and invite and encourage people? Some of you wrestle with this insecurity. But God says he sings over you. In fact, God calls you his righteousness. Not because of what you've done, but because of what he has done for you. And in the Old Testament days, the anointing was a sign of God's approval. So when David says he anoints my head with oil, he's just declaring that God has affirmed me. And there are some of you who need to hear today that God is not mad at you. God is not angry with you. God affirms you. God loves you. And he has a work and a plan for your life. And it doesn't matter what other people have said about you. It doesn't matter the labels that have, they have put on you. God is pouring his oil over your life. He affirms you. You are his daughter. You are his son. And nothing you have done can remove that. Nothing you have done can change that. Receive the affirmation of your father. He loves you. But y'all, not only does he affirm us, but we can rely on his companionship. Look at what the verse says. He says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Here's the promise. You will never be alone because as long as you got breath, there is goodness and mercy right beside you, right behind you. There is mercy. That's the reason you don't look like what you've been through because God's mercy has been on your life. And there are things that you have that you didn't deserve because God's goodness has been on your life. It continues to run after you and chase after you. You, you will never be alone because Jesus says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He's always with you. God is with you. Y'all, here's the last promise of this text. And I'm almost out of my time. Last promise of this text is that we can rely on his accommodations. This is what Jesus says in the Gospels. He says, I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you can be also. Here's the reality. Today, we got the awesome pleasure of dedicating a space that belongs to God. But there is a place that God has created for his children that we can live in his presence forever and ever. There is a hope of glory. I know we don't like to talk about heaven as much anymore, but one day we get the chance to go to where Jesus is. One day every tear will be wiped from our eyes. One day we will see him face to face and behold the beauty of his presence. One day we get to live with him forever. But y'all, we can't rely on this promise unless we get the basics right. There's some of you in this room. You've got to get the first three right. A recognition that God is, that he desires personal relationship with you. It doesn't mean you have to be perfect. God takes ownership of making you into the person that he desires for you to be. And submission to his lordship. And that's the difference. I want to tell you this quick story. Uh, uh, there was, um, let's call it Sheepville. There was a place called Sheepville and all the sheep were living. But all the sheep in the town were feeble. They were weak. And there was one of these weak sheep who saw this big, strong, and mighty sheep. And he wondered, how did he get like that? Because everybody else here is feeble and weak. And one day he decided to follow that big strong sheep home. And when he got to the gate, the fence of his house, 
he looked up to the big strong sheep and said, how did you get like this? Everybody else is weak, weak, feeble, but you are strong. Your wool is pure. How did you get like this? And the big sheep looked at him eye to eye and said to him, I used to be just like you. But the difference is, me and you have a different shepherd and I've found the good shepherd and the good shepherd takes care of me. The good shepherd has led me and developed me and cultivated me. And the good shepherd will do the same for you. Hear the good news that wherever you are, God can reach you, save you, and change you into the person that he desires you to be. There's some of you in this room who are struggling with difficulties and challenges. I want to pray for you as well. Because as we get the basics right, God is going to move in our world and in our life like never before. Let's pray. God, thank you for this day and this opportunity to share your word. Thank you for encouraging us to get back to the basics. God, allow us to recognize that you are God that we need a personal relationship to you and we need to surrender our wills to you. God, help us to receive the benefits that you offer. God, give us the grace to reconcile the difficult realities that we are facing. Give us the right perspective. But God, ultimately help us to rely on you knowing that you are good, that you are for us. And say like, the, the, the writer of scripture says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Help us to trust on you, lean on you, to rely on you and your promises. God, for the person who has never said yes to you, for the person who needs to begin a new relationship with you today, I pray today will be that day. And if that's you, say this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, save me. Change me. Make me into the person that you want me to be. I give my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. And God, for every person in this room, I pray for your favor and blessing. I pray, God, that you would begin to move in our lives. That as we get our priorities in order, that you will begin to move and change things, God. Move in our marriages, God. Move in our homes, God. Move, Lord Jesus, on our jobs. Move in this church, God. Let God arise and let his enemies be scattered. Let God arise and, Lord Jesus, let your presence be felt, God. We decree and declare that this city belongs to you. We decree and declare Augusta belongs to Jesus and you will move, you will reign and we will give you the glory and honor in Jesus name we pray and everybody say amen, amen and amen.